Open your Bibles, if you would, please, to the book of Zechariah and chapter number 7. Zechariah and chapter number 7. And uh, there's a portion of Scripture here that just really uh, spoke to me. And, and you know what? Whenever we look at all the stuff that has happened in the last week, the, uh, uh, the, the, the disaster that happened in, in Paris... Uh, of course, I do remember it wasn't too many weeks ago that uh, our president stood up and made a statement after there had been a shooting uh, on a campus. He stood up and said, uh, tragedies of these kinds, uh, of this kind, does not happen in other uh, civilized countries. Well, I, I think he sort of missed that a little bit because was pretty uh, disastrous on what happened there. And once again, we need to name it for what it is. It is Islamic uh, extremist terrorism. And they've already said that they were part of ISIS and everything else. And so, uh, uh, and by the way, they're already threatening to come to America next. And we see all these things, and, and you know what? After a while, you know, you, you almost get to the, uh, the attitude of saying, well, let's just go over there and just blow them all up. And, uh, you know, that I can understand that. I can understand that feeling. But if we're not careful, we can become, we can, we can get so beat up by all the stuff that's going on in life that we can become cynical and, and we can become hard-hearted. And uh, now, don't misunderstand me. I'm not trying to say that America as a nation, number one, I do not believe that in the last number of years we have done enough to protect our citizens, our sovereignty, and our national integrity. One of the reasons these terrorists continue to attack us is because they know for the most part we're not going to do anything in retaliation. I think we need to go back and read what Thomas Jefferson did with the Barbary pirates, who was also uh, Islamic terrorists, uh, that were pirates on the seas. And, uh, you know, that's how we got the song uh, for the Marine Corps, from the halls of Montezuma to the shores of Tripoli. We actually went and invaded. And, and by the way, we didn't have any more tr trouble out of them for a long time after we did that. But, uh, but anyhow, you know, the deal is we're, we're all dealing with, with crazy things in life. And if we're not careful, we can get hard-hearted. So today I want to preach a message, uh, Lord willing, with the Holy Spirit's help, I want to preach, may God deliver us from hard hearts. May God deliver us from hard hearts. Let's uh, stand together as we read the Word of God. Zechariah chapter number 7, we're going to begin reading in verse number 8. The Bible says, And the word of the Lord came unto Zechariah, saying, Thus speaketh the Lord of hosts, saying, Execute true judgment, and show mercy and compassions every man to his brother. And oppress not the widow, nor the fatherless, the stranger, nor the poor, and let none of you imagine evil against his brother in your heart. But they refused to hearken, and pulled away the shoulder, and stopped their ears, that they should not hear. Yea, they made their hearts as an adamant stone, lest they should hear the law and the words which the Lord of hosts has sent in his spirit by the former prophets. Therefore came a great wrath from the Lord of hosts. Therefore it has come to pass that as he cried and they would not hear, so they cried, and I would not hear, saith the Lord of hosts. But I scattered them with a whirlwind among all the nations whom they knew not. Thus the land was desolate after them, that no man passed through nor returned, for they laid the pleasant land desolate. Let's go to the Lord in prayer. Father, thank you so much, Lord, that we have your word. Thank you so much, Lord, that we have the promise, Lord, that you are present where two or more are gathered in your name. And dear God, we need you today. Lord, I need you today. I need the, the leadership, the encouragement, the comfort, the strength of the Holy Spirit as I preach. And Lord, I pray that you would open every one of our hearts and minds that we might be able to receive your truth today. And Lord, we would be moved by what the Word of God has to say. And we'll thank you for it all in Jesus' name. Amen. We see all the stuff going on, and boy, it's, it's easy to get cynical. Sometimes uh, after, after you deal with enough uh, craziness, you begin to get to the point where you say, well, I just don't care anymore. You ever, you ever hit that point in your life where you say, well, that's it. Just don't care. And yet the truth of the matter is, hopefully you still do to a degree. 
All right. But, uh, you know, uh, the greatest need that people have is to know the Lord. You know, uh, it's not necessarily that they need a new medication. It's not necessarily that they need more money. It's not necessarily that they need more education. I get amazed at society. Every time there's a problem, somebody comes out and says, well, we just need to do a better job educating. Well, I've learned something. You can take a crook uh, that goes into a store and shoplifts and give him an education and he'll learn how to steal the whole store. Okay? The reality is what people need is people need a relationship with the Lord. But you know what? I, I believe one of the greatest problems that we're facing today is, is that we as God's people have too often closed our eyes to the needs of the spiritual needs around us and the spiritual needs of the lost. You know, uh, listen, we're not going to basically, people that don't know Christ as Savior, we are not going to uh, permanently change their lives by just trying to reform them. They don't need reformation, they need regeneration. I mean, they need to get born again. And that is the greatest need that people have, and we can't close our eyes to that need. We, as the people of God, let's go ahead and face something. We are in great need of revival. But it's not going to come if people have hardened their hearts. You know, uh, I, I've shared this before, but I've, I've had it happen more than once. I'd be preaching on a Sunday morning and look out and see somebody and think to myself, Oh my goodness, they are going to think that I am particularly plucking their tail feathers because this message applies directly to them. And I'd preach my message, uh, trying to be obedient to the Lord. And on the way out, as people were shaking my hands, I've had those very people come up and shake my hand and say, Preacher, that was a great message. There were probably folks here today that needed that. And that lets me know that it just went right over their head, or it was sort of like pouring water on a duck's back. It just rolled right off because they didn't even get that they, they were the ones that needed it. You know, we got to be careful. we got to really pray. God, help us and deliver us from having hard hearts. Now look back at, in our text. Well, let's take again a, a quick look at verses 8 through 10. It says, The word of the Lord came unto Zechariah, saying, Thus speaketh the Lord of hosts, saying, Execute true judgment, and show mercy and compassions every man to his brother, and oppress not the widow, nor the fatherless, the stranger, nor the poor, and let none of you imagine evil against his brother in your heart. What, what is the cause of hard hearts. What is the cause? Now, I think we find several, and we could probably go through Scripture and maybe find a hundred other reasons. But in this particular text, let's look at, at three things that I believe are, are, are primary causes for hard hearts. Number one is perverted judgment. When it says in verse number nine, execute true judgment, that leads me to believe that they had been executing judgment that was not true. Therefore, it was perverted judgment. You know, just because a judge sits in a court, and, and we'll use the Supreme Court as an example, just because those judges sit there and make decisions does not mean that they always make right decisions. And we are living with a lot of the circumstances of them making very poor decisions. When you stop and think about the, the tens of millions of babies that have never been able to come to life because they, they made a ruling years ago that, uh, that abortion was legal in all 50 states. That was never passed by the Congress. That was never signed by the President. It was just some justices on the Supreme Court made the decision and then people said well it's the law of the land you know one of the reasons is there is perverted judgment and how does that happen we follow our ways instead of God's ways you know anytime we start elevating our opinion and making it equal with God's opinion we are in trouble as a people Proverbs chapter 14 and verse number 12 says this, There is a way which seemeth right unto a man, but the end thereof are the ways of death. You know, so many times when I'm talking to people, they will, they will use these words. They'll say, 
my opinion, I don't see anything wrong with this. But then I'll always go back and say, but wait a minute, what does the Bible say? And they want to say, well, you know, I, I just don't know if I accept that or not. You know what? If you don't have foundational truth, then, then let me get you to understand something. There is no such thing as truth. If there is not absolute truth, then all truth is relative. And what is true today might be false tomorrow. And what is false today may be true tomorrow. And, and by the way, that's the way our society has been operating. And I hate to say this, but that happens way too often, sometimes even within the walls of a Bible-believing local church. We want to elevate our opinions up above God's opinions. And so we follow our ways. We choose to believe things that please us rather than absolute truth. In Psalm 19 and verse number 7, notice what it says here. And, uh, and this is a, a good portion of Scripture. It says, The law of the Lord is perfect, converting the soul. The testimony of the Lord is sure, making wise the simple. The statutes of the Lord are right, rejoicing the heart. The commandment of the Lord is pure, enlightening the eyes. The fear of the Lord is clean, enduring forever. The judgments of the Lord are true and righteous altogether. More to be desired are they than gold, yea, than much fine gold, sweeter also than honey and the honeycomb. Moreover, by them is thy servant warned, and in keeping of them there is great reward. Now that lets us know that is the basis for absolute truth is the Word of God. Now someone might say, but wait a minute, what about all the other religions of the world? Is, isn't their teachings absolute truth as well? Well now you're going to have to make a real hard decision right there. Is the God of the Bible correct? Is Jesus, who he says he is, the way, the truth, and the life? And no man cometh unto the Father but by me. Now, that's what he said. Is that a true statement or is it not a true statement? Now let's go ahead and make things easy for us. If that is not a true statement, then let's just go ahead and close the doors of the church. Let's all go do something else on Sunday morning because nothing really matters anymore if Jesus is not who he said he was. But if Jesus is who he said he was, then we owe him our devotion. And we need to understand that he is the way, the truth, and the life. You know, I, I get amazed sometimes when I'm talking to folks, that they will use what I like to refer to as circular reasoning. Now, you know what I mean when I use circular reasoning? They'll say, well, this is what I believe in. And then they will make their argument all the way around the corner just to get right back to their initial position and they don't want to be confused with facts. You know, sometimes we've got to say, okay, what does God say? What does God say? And adjust my opinion to what God says. You know, the truth of the matter is, if I just went on the basis of my opinion, I'd probably end up in prison sometimes. You know, I may end up in trouble sometimes because I could convince myself, oh, this is all right for me to do when really it would be something that would be devastating to do. You know, uh, truth of the matter is I've joked about this for years and I am joking when I say this. OK, uh, I don't I'm not always real patient when I'm driving. OK, uh, I think Katie one time thought that I was trying to, uh, to run over her one time because she wasn't going fast enough, and I got behind her. I knew it was her, and I was really aggravating her on top of anything else. But uh, the truth of the matter is, I've, I've often joked saying, man, I would love to have a button that I could push, have a spot that would pop open in my hood, and have a, a, a bazooka come up out of the hood there, and, and just let them see it in the rearview mirror. I got a feeling they'd get out of the way. Amen? Now, I'm not going to do that, of course. But the truth of the matter is, if we let our own mind come up with all kind of crazy ideas, we can convince ourselves of anything if we try hard enough. We need absolute foundational truth. We cannot have perverted judgment. We also have a problem that we, we get hard hearts when we have a lack of compassion for others. A lack of compassion for others. 
You know, we can sort of get sort of insulated in our own little world and, and forget about the fact that other people out there have needs. You know, one thing I've, I've enjoyed uh, watching our brotherhood is the fact that if we know there's a need somewhere that can be uh, taken care of uh, by our guys, that they get in there and they do some of those things. I, I'm, I'm encouraged by the number of people that are interested in going on mission trips. You know, we got a group that's going to be going up in December to the Appalachians to hand out the backpacks that we were, that we were putting together. And they're going up into an area that is extremely poor. And they're going to be passing out these backpacks. And I think that is good because that helps develop compassion for others. For those that have gone to the Dominican Republic and done surgeries on people that otherwise would never be able to, to have surgery to make them, make them have a better quality of life and gone out into the villages and had vacation Bible schools with the kids and witness to the people in the villages and do construction work so that they can have a, a better school uh, down in those villages. You know, all of that is important because it shows that we have compassion for other people. Whenever we send groups off for disaster relief, when there's been great catastrophes, I think that's great. We need to have compassion for other people. The truth of the matter is, there's somebody out there that, that you can reach them Better than anybody else. But in order to do it, you've got to have some compassion. The book of Jude, in verse 22, one little phrase there that I think is so good. And it says, and of some have compassion, making a difference. You'd be amazed sometimes at what a difference can be made if you just show somebody a little bit of compassion. Don't pervert judgment. Make sure that we maintain compassion. And then it goes on and says, and, and evil imaginations. Evil imaginations. Now, I believe this. And, and I can speak to this from personal experience. The greatest spiritual battles happen first within our minds. Nobody just is out walking down the road one day and just out of the blue take a right hand turn into a bank and go rob it. Nobody does that. Not anybody in their right mind anyhow. Nobody just goes to work one day totally happy and, and when they get to work decide, hey, today's the day I'm going to cheat on my spouse. Nobody does that. All of those things happen because first the battle has been raging up here. The battle is in the mind. And, and, and we need to safeguard against those evil imaginations. You see, constant communion with Christ is really the only thing that can give us a reliable safeguard for the battle that goes on within our mind. In Philippians chapter 4, verses 6 and 7, it says, Be careful for nothing, but in everything by prayer and supplication with thanksgiving, let your requests be made known unto God. And the peace of God, which passeth all understanding, shall keep your heart and minds through Christ Jesus. I'll tell you what, I have to l go back and rely on those passages a lot. You know why? Because life is filled with anxiety. Life is filled with concern. And the only thing that's going to get us through it is the peace of God. And the only way you and I are going to have the peace of God is we've got to spend time with Him. That's the only way it's going to happen. And so we need to safeguard because the cause of hard hearts uh, in, in our text here is perverted judgment, a lack of compassion, and evil imaginations. Now, now drop down to verse number 11. What does it say there in our text? But they refused to hearken and pulled away the shoulder and stopped their ears that they should not hear. Yea, they made their hearts as an adamant stone lest they should hear the law and the words which the Lord of hosts has sent in His Spirit by the former prophets. Therefore came a great wrath from the Lord of hosts. Therefore it, can't, it, it has come to pass that as he cried, they would not hear. So they cried, and I would not hear, saith the Lord of hosts. Did you notice that? He says, I cried to them, they refused to listen, so now when they cry back to me, I won't listen. You say, well, that's pretty harsh. Yeah. Verse 14, But I scattered them with a whirlwind among all the nations whom they knew not. Thus the land was desolate after them that no man passed through nor returned, for they laid the pleasant land desolate. You know, that I realize that is primarily written to the children of Israel. 
It was a message that Zechariah was given by God to preach uh, to the people. Okay, but the reality is it's still the same God and the same principles are there. If we want God to be near to us in our trouble, we need to be near to God uh, the rest of the time. When He is leading our lives, we need to be uh, sensitive to Him. Now the problem is, too many times there's a refusal to hear truth. One of the saddest conversations I have, and it happens too often, is when someone says, I don't want to hear it. I don't want to hear it. I know what I want to do. I don't want to hear it. Just leave me alone. Hmm. Proverbs chapter 28, verse number 9. It says, He that turneth away his ear from hearing the law, even his prayer shall be abomination. Don't want to hear it, God. Want to do my own thing? Leave me alone. Let me go my own way. You know what? After a while, God says, fine, you want to go your own way, go your own way, but you've got to live with the, uh, with the consequences. Wow. I have learned the consequences are many times awfully harsh. And it's not a wise thing to refuse to hear truth. And then hearts get made adamant and unmoved to the call and the will of God. You know, I think one of the greatest illustrations that we have of, of this hard heart syndrome is in the book of Exodus. God called Moses. Now, interesting thing about Moses. Moses really had to wait a long time before God used him. First 40 years of his life, he was raised as Pharaoh, uh, Pharaoh's daughter's son. Uh, some scholars believe that he was actually in line to become perhaps the next Pharaoh. After 40 years, he went out to check the children of Israel out because he knew that he was a Hebrew and, and saw Egyptians abusing the Hebrews and, and actually killed one of the Egyptians to protect the Hebrew people. He wanted to be their deliverer. Next day, he went out there and found two Hebrews arguing and stepped in. And one of them said to the other one, what are you going to do, kill me like you did the Egyptian yesterday? And he found out word was out, what he had done. And, and Pharaoh wanted him dead. He took off and fled. Spent the next 40 years in the wilderness as a nomad. And after that 40 years, then God called him from the burning bush and sent him back. He went in before Pharaoh and he said, let my people go that they might serve the Lord. And the Bible says over and over and over again, and Pharaoh hardened his heart. Not going to do it. Even though he saw miracles, even though he saw the power of God, he said, nope, not going to do it. He hardened his heart, he hardened his heart, he hardened his heart. And there came a time when God then, to show his own power and sovereignty, even God continued to harden his heart just to show his power. But Pharaoh hardened his own heart before God ever intervened in that way. Listen, I believe this. Each time we harden our heart to God, it grows easier to continue hardening our hearts. I know I've shared this before. But many years ago, we had a guy that was very, very involved in ministry. And some things happened, and for whatever reason, he just dropped out. And his wife one day said to him, doesn't it bother you that, that you're just not involved the way you were at one time? He says, after a while, it just doesn't bother you that much anymore. After a while, it just doesn't bother you that much anymore. That shows a hard heart. A hard heart. God help us. I don't, want, I don't want there to be there. And I believe we, we invite great wrath from the Lord when hard hearts alienate us from the Lord. Proverbs 29, 18 says, Where there is no vision, the people perish. But he that keepeth the law, happy is here. All right? We've, we've looked at the, the, the cause of hard hearts, the condemnation of, of hard hearts. All right, let's quickly, in closing, look at the cure for hard hearts. I don't know about you, but I'm glad there's a cure. Amen? 
I'm glad that we just don't get there and God says, okay, that's it. I'm writing you off. You're finished. Uh, f- uh, forget about it. You know, the cure for hard hearts, number one, starts off with, with, with a basic thing. I believe it's important that we would be willing to do what is right. You go back to uh, verse number 9. It says, execute true judgment. Do right. One of the greatest quotes that a preacher has ever made was old Dr. Bob Jones Sr. Uh, when he said, do right. Though the stars fall, do right. I'm going to tell you what, sometime the world we're living in today, it gets a little hard to do right. But it's still right to do right. It's never wrong to do right. Uh, uh, to do right, and it's never right to do wrong. If I confuse you, the truth of the matter is do right. Though the stars fall, do right, and we need to open our ears to the Lord. In Psalm one thirty, here David is is just calling out, crying out. In verse one, he says, "Out of the depths have I cried unto Thee, O Lord." Lord, hear my voice. Let thine ears be attentive to the voice of my supplications. If thou, Lord, shouldest mark iniquities, O Lord, who shall stand? But there is forgiveness with thee that thou mayest be feared. I wait for the Lord. My soul doth wait, and in his word do I hope. My soul waiteth for the Lord more than they that watch for the morning. I say more than they that watch for the morning. You know, I've been intrigued by that phrase there, that watch for the morning. You ever have one of those sleepless nights where your life is filled with anxiety and care and concern and you just can't sleep? And you're just laying there waiting for the morning to come. You know what? It may not always be easy, but the right thing to do is wait on the Lord. Wait on the Lord. Trust in Him. My soul doth wait, and in His word do I hope. More than they that watch for the morning. And then we just need to simply fall upon God's mercy. Man, isn't that a good place to fall? Psalm 130, verses 7 and 8, it says, Let Israel hope in the Lord. For with the Lord there is mercy. And with Him is plenteous redemption. And He shall redeem Israel from all His iniquities. With the Lord there is mercy. I'm going to tell you what. I never go to God and say, God, give me what's coming to me. I want what's mine. Not me. Now, now maybe you're a better person than me, but I never go and say, God, give me what I deserve. No, I go to God and say, God, I need mercy. I need redemption. I need help. I need you. God, give me mercy. You know, I believe the mercy of God is the only thing that's going to help us overcome a hard heart. When I was a kid, I grew up angry and bitter. And I look back on those days and I regret the amount of my life that I basically wasted while I was angry and bitter. Thanks be unto God, a good Bible-believing church influenced my life, and God began to work, and I turned to God and asked for His help and asked for His mercy, and God was able to take the old hard, stony heart and change it into a heart that cared. You know what? It was the mercy of God that did it. And if the mercy of God could do it for me, the mercy of God can do it for you and for every one of us. You know what? I don't know what you're facing. Maybe I preach this message today entirely for me. But I'm telling you, we've got to make sure that we don't live with a hard heart. Because we are only hurting ourselves. God help us. To have tender and compassionate hearts. You know, the greatest danger for a hard heart is when we get dull to the conviction and the wooing of the Holy Spirit. You know, we need to turn to God with a fresh zeal. 
a zeal for Him, to walk with Him, to commune with Him, to live in obedience with Him. And nothing is more useless to the work of God and the needs of others than for us to have hard hearts. God help us. By the way, if you're here today and you don't know Christ as your Savior, let me me tell you this, don't harden your heart. If the Spirit of God is convicting you to let you know you need Jesus, don't leave here today without putting your faith and trust in Christ. We're going to give an invitation in just a moment. I want to invite you. You come. Meet me down here at the front. We'll have somebody take their Bible and show you how to trust Christ. But we need a revival of tender hearts. We need a revival of compassionate hearts. We need a revival of caring hearts. We need a revival of submissive hearts. God, deliver us from hard hearts. Let's go to the Lord in prayer. Father, what if I could tell you that I could share with you the best news imaginable? I'm sure that'd be a refreshing thought when we consider that normally what we hear on television and the radio today is nothing but bad news. What if I could share with you the fact that we could spend eternity in a perfect place where everything is joyful and there's no more sin or death or suffering. Of course, the Bible tells us that place is called heaven. Now, there are many religions that all have different ways to tell you how they perceive that you could get to heaven. Most religions say, do this, do that, do the other. And if you do enough of the good stuff, then you just might make it. I'm glad that there's a better way than what religion says. The Bible tells us that God loves us. In fact, in John 3, 16, the Bible says, For God so loved the world that He gave His only begotten Son, that whosoever believeth in Him should not perish but have everlasting life. You know, the fact of the matter is we could never do enough on our own to be acceptable to God because we're sinners. We're fallen. And God knows that, and that's why Jesus came to this earth. He lived a sinless life. He died on the cross of Calvary. He shed his blood. But that's not the end of the story. When they put his body in the grave, three days and three nights later, the Bible says that he rose again. He conquered death. And today, he's seated at the right hand of the Father to be our Savior, to be our High Priest, to be the mediator between us and a holy and righteous God. Now for us to have the right relationship with Him, it's not that we have to do things to earn His favor. He's already done all that is necessary. He came, He died, He paid for our sins. The only thing that He requires is that we accept Him as our Savior. The Bible says that if thou shalt confess with thy mouth the Lord Jesus and shalt believe in thine heart that God hath raised him from the dead, thou shalt be saved. For with the heart man believeth unto righteousness, and with the mouth confession is made unto salvation. And then to be able to accept this great salvation, the Bible says very simply, for whosoever shall call upon the name of the Lord shall be saved. Dear friend, Salvation is as simple as us accepting by faith what Jesus did for us on the cross of Calvary and then calling out by faith to Him and accepting that wonderful gift of salvation. The greatest decision you'll ever make is to trust Christ as Savior. And I'd like to encourage you to trust Christ today as your Savior. And then you can go to Him in prayer and you can pray something like this and say, Dear God, I know I'm a sinner, but I know you died for me on the cross. And right now, right here, I accept you as my Savior. Please save me, and I thank you for your promise to do so. And you can pray that in Jesus' name, and you can have the best news ever that you've got a home waiting for you in heaven with the Lord Jesus Christ. God bless you.